Hello and welcome to UAT Time within the United Country Special by First Ukraine. You can find us on the frequencies available on our website firstua.com. I'm Sergei Vilichansky. And I am Olivier Vedrin. UAT Time is dedicated to bring Ukraine and Europe closer to each other by introducing the real Ukraine to the rest of the world. We're not alone while people around the globe stay by our side. Our guest today is Marta Dichok. Is a professor in politics and history of the University of Western Ontario. Welcome to the show. Welcome to our tea time. Thank you Welcome. for inviting me. Uh, you've been to Ukraine quite a lot. Many times. Many times. Actually, you couldn't even put your finger on the number how many times you traveled. Um, what brought you this time? This time I'm on a half sabbatical. Okay. And um, I decided to start a new research project. And what I'm doing is I'm collecting interviews with internally displaced people and recording their individual stories so that I can then do some academic work with it, but also to create a database. Mm. Because when we, uh, this is one of the big problems in Ukraine right now, the war, the internally displaced in the economy. And when looking at how the story of the internally displaced is presented, it's statistics, mm -hmm. it's politics. But what I want to do is put human faces on this. Yeah. And so I'm finding people and conducting interviews with them. And once it's all finished, I'll deposit it in our university library so it'll be a nice database available to anybody. Yeah, I wish it was uh, something much funnier than this. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the recent year and a half, over uh, a million and a half mm -hmm. displaced people in Ukraine, mm -hmm. which we would have never even thought of uh, happening, anything happening like this. So, uh, unfortunately, I doubt that the stories are, uh, you know, with a lot of uh, They're not happy stories. Yes. They're not happy stories, but they're very diverse. Yes. They're mm -hmm. very, very diverse. Well, uh, that's good to have a sense of humanity when you do some research, I mm -hmm. think, and to put a, a figure, of an image on all those mm -hmm. figures and numbers. Yes. Um, you mentioned that you uh, taught some courses here as well, right? Yes. Yes. I, I came here, actually. <laughs> I, I see your eyes like going like, I love like, teaching, and I'm, it's fall is coming, so I'm just preparing. But I came here to do research for my PhD on Ukrainian refugees during World War II. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I was doing archival work, and this was way back in the Soviet Union. It was 1991 in the spring, and the Soviet Union started teetering and I thought oh it's too interesting to sit in the archives so I became a journalist and I wrote for The Guardian and for Radio Canada International and um, and that's when the University of Cape Mohill Academy was being planned mm -hmm. and they invited me to come and teach so when I finished my PhD at Oxford I came and I taught at Cave Mohill for a few years and continued doing some journalism and then I went back and got a job in Canada and now I continue to come every summer to do research and we'll be teaching a course in, in, at Cave Mohill again, so I'm looking forward to that. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> now uh, let's. Um, you mentioned Canada because mm -hmm. that's mostly where you. That's where I'm from. That's where yeah. you're from. Mm -hmm. You definitely live there, and uh, uh, and uh, your activist. You are an activist there, the, uh, in well. our terms. Uh, well, the, uh, at least that's what I was told that. Mm -hmm. the, the, you can tell us more about the volunteers. Uh, well, I mean, I, I watch what happens. I try to okay. report it as much as possible. I participate when I can. Um, what happened, I mean, my activities are mainly in the academic sphere, but when the Euromaidan erupted, um, the Ukrainian community in Toronto and across Canada and other parts of the world as well started organizing protests of support. Mm -hmm. So I went to all of those and reported on them. I did a lot of commentary for various media outlets on what was happening. And then when the war started and all of that, a lot of volunteer organizations sort of appeared and they're doing things like collecting funds for, um, for the displaced people, for the war effort, for all sorts of um, medical supplies and, mm -hmm. and that. So there's, there's tons of stuff going on in Canada. So And the diaspora is very active in Canada, yeah? Very much so. And um, they've also, they, they've been active in sort of organizing, as I described, the protests and, and that sort of thing. But they've also been very active in um, advocacy 
and you might remember Canada uh, during the Euromaidan and um, after the annexation of Crimea and in the early part of the war was really uh, a leading voice from the international community mm -hmm. in um, uh, taking a very active stance in criticizing mm -hmm. the use of violence against protesters uh, and then the annexation and introducing sanctions. And that was in part because the Ukrainian community was actively contacting the yes. Harper government and saying, do something, do something. So it was, I, I, I don't, well, wouldn't Sort say, of lobbying. Well, they like to use the term advocacy. Okay. But, yeah, um, yes. I saw also yeah. that you are uh, the Jasper in Canada uh, is very active to support also the um, military effort uh, in Atozona. You, uh, you send some uniform. You well, send Canada, some, I think, yeah. was one of the first ones who yeah. really yeah. supplied yeah. the uniform. And uh, because I saw some, uh, yeah. I saw some Canadian friend, and they they, they they buy some uniform. They send uniform mm. to to Ato, and uh, great job. Yeah, no, they were supporting. Initially, the volunteer battalions, but also um, Canada was, I believe, the first to give non-lethal military aid to Ukraine. Yes. Um, yes. You were on. on the, you were one of the first country who did some sanction. Yeah, that's yeah. what. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I remember the sanctions. That. So that's what Canada was taking a very leading role mm -hmm. in in a lot of this. It's no longer taking such an active mm -hmm. role now the EU has become more more engaged. Yeah, okay. but in the early days, Canada. That was Canada. Yeah. Well, thank you, Canada. What can I say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, but is that partially because there is some parallelism between uh, what took place back in the 70s mm -hmm. in um, Canada uh, with the terroristic attacks and some uh, separatistic movements and uh, you know with Ukraine nowadays yeah. would you please give us a little more uh, background of what did take place then this is a question I've been asked before the parallels um, people see them um, I would say the parallels are not that great okay because what was happening in Quebec in the 70s was an indigenous separatist movement what's happening in eastern Ukraine is not so yeah. that's a fundamental very difference. difference. Well, you, is it and obvious the difference? Honestly, because absolutely, you, you know, the because propaganda. It wasn't a matter of France. We didn't going send into troops. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we but didn't send what I'm troops. saying is, sometimes it seems like you know, yeah. some, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, people from whatever countries they are blind enough to not see that, mm -hmm. but. Uh, the term referendum is used a lot in Crimea, in Donbass. Um, there were events that were called referenda that were held there. Mm. In Quebec, there were real referenda yeah. uh -huh. that were organized mm. by the government, okay. that were properly held, mm. and the results were announced. Okay. So the terminology mm. that's being used is why it sounds mm. like it could be similar. Mm. But the desire for separatism in Quebec is genuine. Mm. But it's not the majority, and mm. hopefully it won't be because I like Canada the way it is, and I yes. don't want Quebec yes. to leave. But I, I can understand why a certain portion of uh, Quebec society felt very dissatisfied mm. with what their status was within Canada, mm. and so they had this movement. And the Parti Québécois continues to exist, but it has poor electoral results, okay. mm. and that's. The separatist movement in eastern Ukraine and Crimea also it exists, mm -hmm. but it was never a majority, yes. and I think that's the point. And, and it became uh, the events that are happening now um, were were triggered from abroad. Yes, mm -hmm. it wasn't indigenous, and that's yeah. the key difference. And, uh, we really, uh, Sergey, uh, France uh, didn't send money, and France don't want uh, Quebec independence. You know, this is uh, yeah, this yeah. Is really new. We, we we were not like uh, involved in this uh, yeah. way of independence. Uh, yes, you remember the sentence of General de Gaulle, but this is that was a more provocation. That's a, a real mm -hmm. political. Uh, uh, Movement, then read big difference, and then between what's happened in the east with the re Russian support and Quebec is. It's a, okay. Yeah, I mean there was never this new France sure. initiative like the yeah. Novorossiya. No, no, no. Novorossiya, yeah. Well, Impossible. yes, and now with all of the, you know, ammunition that they waste by shelling and using every day, 
uh, that's the budget of uh, uh, you know typical uh, little country every day you know they're wasting their spending where do they get this money well um, now well uh, you're a historian I'm sure as you teach uh, mm -hmm. You do draw some lessons from history, and uh, what 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 do you think? What do you what would be your message right now uh, if you got a chance to uh, you know teach uh, maybe a summer class to Ukrainian students? What would be your message? Well, I would really like to teach some politicians okay. because I think that politicians would really I have do well to, to learn I have 450 students that <laughs> just we need to make sure that they come. Yeah. Um, I mean, the <laughs> thing the about parliament. history is uh, there's that saying, those who don't learn their history are doomed to repeat it. Um, mm. But it's also important to keep in mind that um, history is just the background because in the interwar period, people were busy learning the lessons of why World War I happened, and that contributed to the outbreak of World War II. Mm -hmm. So we can't learn policy options from the past. Mm -hmm. What we can learn is what happened and why it happened, and what we don't yeah. want to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in terms of looking forward, which is what I think is really important here, there's a real need for new solutions because the conflict that's happening in Ukraine right now, it's a new kind of hybrid war. Yeah. And history doesn't have the answers in how to resolve it. Mm -hmm. So what's really needed is political scientists and international relations experts and strategic studies and military experts to all come together and think of how to, uh, first of all, stop the conflict in Ukraine and secondly, reorganize the international uh, community architecture because the existing institutions are proving to be completely inadequate, whether mm -hmm. it's in Ukraine or whether it's in the Middle East. Or uh, in Africa. These conflicts mm -hmm. are ongoing. People are being killed every day, and these international institutions that were designed to keep the peace internationally, mm -hmm. they're not working anymore. And at the end of the Second World War, people came together and created <coughs> new institutions, and that's what needs to happen now. A new, new mechanisms new, new and um, one of our former prime ministers, uh, Lester B. Pearson, he was innovative. He came up with the idea of peacekeeping during the Suez crisis. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a new way of resolving a crisis, and yes. that's what we need. To do. We need someone to. I mean, I've been thinking mm -hmm. about this, but I don't have the answers yet. Okay. Uh, but we need to sort of see how things didn't work in the past and how to make them work now. Well, you know, you know you are, we have a big illusion in uh, diplomacy. Uh, some, a lot of person think that international community exists, and that's n no, no. The international community, as a big power, yeah. does not exist. Yeah. We have several interests, yeah. and uh, the model of, of this uh, after the Second World War, the UN is now past, model of the past. And we need to uh, reorganize the uh, international community to make the international community efficient, even in international law. Because now we have a problem of international law. What we can do when a country mm -hmm. do a criminal annexion? Mm -hmm. yeah. We can do nothing with our instruments now. Yeah. We well, have to make <coughs> new international law. And I'm sure there are, you know, much smarter and more experienced people are, you know, breaking their brains right now and uh, trying to develop the new, the new approach with the, all the new challenges. Mm -hmm. Really, the year and a half, uh, these past year and a half has uh, changed, I mean, very much. Now, the question is, what do you think? Uh, first of all, uh, will the elections in Donbass take place uh, in October. In October. <laughs> well, well, we'll see. I, I don't. I can't predict the future. Um, I, I'm listening carefully to the arguments on both sides, and I have to say I'm slightly on the fence because I can see the rationale for holding them, and I can see the rationale for, for suspending them until they can be properly held. So mm -hmm. I, I haven't quite decided what I think about that. 
but I don't think that elections are really the key issue. I think the, the key issue is that um, the, the war effort seems to be stalled. And everybody's talking, not everybody, but elections are being discussed a lot. Mm -hmm. But how will that help resolve the conflict? Um, I don't see that that's going to be a solution. But there are some other conditions, not only with the elections, but the borders need to be secured yeah. by Ukrainian side. Without the borders, that no point in elections. It will be another uh, uh, show mm -hmm. and nothing else. Yeah. So-called elections. Yeah, I think you know the solution of this war is in the Kremlin. Is not in the election in the Donbas. The result of this war is in the Kremlin. Is the, re the result will be uh, the future of Putin. This war will stop when Putin uh, will be removed from the power. Do you think no. it? Do you think because it, now it is this is not only Putin but the system, mm -hmm. and really this war will continue until the system will continue in Russia. But, but do you remember Soviet Union? Because it's imperial view, you know. When somebody stepped stepped out, someone else from the system stepped in, yeah. and as a, a successor who yeah. has not been, uh, you know, had never been better, in in a sense, but uh, he just. Yeah. Khrushchev was much better than Stalin. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. 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 But, because um, the, ta the time demanded some gradual evolutional change. Well, perhaps this will happen in the Kremlin again. But uh, well, I, we don't I, have I, years I agree or 50. with you that um, what happens in the Kremlin has a determining fate in yeah. the Donbass and Crimea. And um, I think Putin will sooner or later be held accountable by his own people. Yeah. But your question also is what happens next? Because the political elite in Russia right now has been so concentrated yeah. and, and dominated that, um, you know, we saw Nemtsov being killed. We see opponents yeah. being eliminated. There isn't sort of a strong opposition. Unlike in Ukraine, when Yanukovych left, there was a whole bunch of politicians yes. to choose from. There's always been an opposition in Ukraine. And in Russia, I don't see it. So the question is who would follow and, you know, how quickly those changes would happen. Although I remain optimistic because it, it, something will have to change sooner or later. But um, it's also, I think, the Ukrainian government needs to be b being a little more proactive. You know, you know my link with the Russian opposition. I, I, yes. I work very closely with the Russian opposition. I am very involved in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, all my friends from the Russian opposition uh, say to me that please win in Ukraine, and after that, we can, you, you will help us to change in Russia. But the first step is to win in Ukraine, really. But the, win the war, you mean? Yeah, no, to win, to, to, to reform Ukraine. Okay. To, okay. Because when, if Ukraine will be a success, that can be a, a, an amazing uh, way of change for Russia. I, I agree, but they have to be responsible for themselves. They can't yeah. wait or ask someone else to... Uh, you so know, now more and more of my friends uh, from Russia, from intellectual journalists, and we talked about that, now they come to Kiev yeah. because they cannot discuss in Moscow. That's right. well. And you know, I had a meeting with the Russian opposition in Lviv. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Yeah. In Lviv with the Russian opposition. Yes. Yeah, actually, they're even talking about uh, setting up a cabinet of uh, the uh, government yeah. in exile. A shadow cabinet. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. That, that's we, an excellent we, we, idea. we want to do that. Well, I think that's an excellent idea, but they have to uh, take responsibility for their own <coughs> politics. And I, I appreciate that yeah. they're looking to Ukraine, but um, you know, the same way that Ukraine has to take responsibility for itself yes, exactly. and not wait for someone to help them. I mean, obviously, help is welcome, mm -hmm. but people have to take responsibility and do everything they can. But this is a very big um, problem in the psychology of the Russian citizen because they are waiting everything about well, from the leader, well, not from, that's, that's the difference. Yeah. No? Yes, <clears throat> now, but, but, but my question is, uh, the conflict in Donbass uh, takes away, uh, you know, uh, uh, some numbers of uh, lives of soldiers and uh, civilians every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, should it 
how can we stop? Well, it seems like with actually, you know, I don't know if you've heard of, you know, yesterday and the the previous a couple of days. I mean, major, major uh, escalation, renewal of uh, shelling, yep. ex escalation of mm -hmm. the. I mean, again, the use of the forbidden weaponry yep. and all that. Uh, uh, even onto new territories, mm -hmm. closer to Mariupol no, and uh, no. some the other... outskirts of Mariupol, Sartana. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Yep. Actually, two, three people, mm -hmm. uh, just civilians, uh, were killed. Now, the question is, uh, military way or diplomatic way? I don't think it's the either or. I think okay. it's both and more. No. No. I think, Both and more, yeah. I think and economical, like sanctions. Economic, diplomatic, information. Uh, there's, there's the, this war is multidimensional. Yeah. And yes. the solution and the peace has to be multidimensional. Mm. So it's, it's, I mean, the military, um, I have a lot of questions about the conduct of the war on the Ukrainian side. And if you've had, um, men from the front in your studio if you haven't you should uh, listen to what they say because quite a number of them are saying that uh, they're they're questioning the command structure yeah. Yeah, 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 that they know. are ready to um, not advance into Russian territory yeah, but simply to, to take back the Ukrainian um, territory and they're not being given the correct um, they're not being allowed to do that uh, this is the anniversary of that uh, the Yes. Uh, and again, um, there's an exhibit of a photo exhibit that was done by four photojournalists who just happened to be there mm -hmm. because one Actually, never knows. Actually, it's going on, the yes. photo exhibit now. It's a very okay. good exhibit. Yes. And one of the correspondents was saying that if you look at what the government was saying at the time the events were happening, it's mm -hmm. very different from what was going on. Now, that's not unusual. All mm -hmm. governments have to present a certain image of the war, whether it's the U.S. or Ukrainian yeah. government, mm -hmm. that's normal. But um, the questions of what's going on within the military, mm -hmm. I think those are very serious questions that I would like to see addressed more. I don't think that's being addressed enough. Because, as you said, I mean, that's the, you know, listening to the casualty figures. It's, yes. It's, it breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We we talked about that with uh, our friend, um, secret expert, you know, uh, Volodymyr Polevi. Yes. And uh, he, he was very angry about that, about, about that Mary. Mm -hmm. and, but I think this is, you know, come on, you, um, the command general, they did the same school than the Russian general, and they are they were in the same classroom, and they and and they are and I think they were surprised about this war. And also, I think they're, they're, I am agree with you, they had a problem of management of this war, really. Because in the, with the chief of battalion, with uh, lieutenant, captain, chief of battalion, everything was okay, really. But when you go at the top, yeah. something is wrong. And we know that some, some of them, some of them were Mm -hmm. Some agent mm -hmm. of yes. Russia, yes. and you know that uh, the uh, SBU did a great work. Mm -hmm. They fired a lot of them yeah. because the uh, SBU really helped a, a lot Ukraine, and the SBU uh, fired a lot of them. And now more and more we will have a mm -hmm. good professional. But at the beginning that was yes. Yeah. But, but uh, again, and the symbolic thing. Uh, first of all, well, psychological and symbolic. Psychological is that at that time, our uh, soldiers and uh, commanders w uh, were not prepared to fight the Russians. Of course, Yanukovych destroyed the army. Yeah, no, 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 no. but what, when actually the Russian uh, military showed up at Ilovaisk and mm -hmm. all of those uh, areas, that's when the real uh, clashes took place. Mm -hmm with the Russian uh, regular army. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, psychological. Mm -hmm. I think we have overcome because that. Because uh, during year and year, they say Russia, Russian, uh, your brother, blah, blah, blah. And Putin now, this is a war between brothers in the same family because of Putin. Yeah. Well, but, uh, but then symbolic is all of those events took place in August, uh, surrounding the 24th right. of August, the Independence that's Day right. of Ukraine. 
Well, yes, that's why now, we can be we can be afraid about now what these happen. days. Again, the celebrations of independence, and uh, looks like some provocations are starting to take place. I hope we we'll learn from the lessons from the history and uh, try not to make mistakes, I the hope. same mistakes, right? Um, Time is running. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have run out of oh, time. Oh, wow, that was so good. Yes. Very interesting. Um, what, do you want to say anything to, uh, to actually, it's uh, international viewers. They're the ones mm -hmm. that are going to be watching the program. What do you want to tell them? Final comment. Yes. Well, I think it's important that people watch what's going on in Ukraine. I think that over the past mm -hmm. um, eight months, nine months, Ukraine has really slipped from the international headlines. Yeah. If you look at uh, you know, the major international media outlets, Ukraine hardly ever appears anymore. And that's not because there aren't things happening in Ukraine. It's because the war has started to drag on. Yes. Um, but there are a lot of very important and interesting things happening in Ukraine. There's politics, the war. Uh, there's also a lot of dynamism happening in this country and I keep going to music festivals and I just am amazed that despite the war there's such a vibrant cultural mm -hmm. scene. So I would just say look to see what's going on because there's a lot of interesting things going on here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It was Marta Dychuk uh, visiting with us and uh, sharing a cup of tea with us. History, despite its wretching pain, cannot be unleaved, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. It was United Country UA Tea Time by First Ukraine. Thanks for joining us for a cup of tea. Olivier Vedrin and Sergei Velichansky were working for you in the studio. Stay with us and we will show you the real Ukraine. Thank you for being with us. Have a good day and see you soon. <laughs>